Assalamu alaikum, I am Dr. Mohamed Ali Rabani. I am part 2 resident of FCPS Anatomy and today on the forum of Medicals Academics we are going to discuss the anatomy questions of neuroanatomy. Uh, for the purpose of this video we will be using medicine and allied component of SK Golden 9 inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman uh, If I have been seen further it's by standing on the shoulders of the giants. Um, this video has been made possible with the help of contents and illustrations obtained from other sources. The authors do not claim con ownership to any of the material that is not mine. D the due credit will be given to the original source to the best of my ability. So today is the big lecture inshallah. The topic is neuroanatomy. It's a very big topic. It's actually a big subject. We're going to try to discuss all of its questions, at least the question present in SK9 medicine and allied uh, within this time uh, bear with me this will be a large video uh, I, i'll try to cover all of them in the best time i can bismillahirrahmanirrahim so first the questions regarding the histology of cns so there is myelination of cns myelination of cns is done by the oligodendrocytes this is the oligodendrocytes and for the reference you should also know that myelination of peripheral nervous system is done by Schwann cells and the difference between them is that in peripheral nervous system one Schwann cell is dedicated wholly to one axon in central nervous system one oligodendrocyte is myelinating number of axons at the same time Nissel's bodies is found in and uh, I have repeatedly found that question formulation and at least in this particular book is a little shaky so you should know what actually is Nissel bodies it should not be the question that it is found in and the question should better be it is made up of Nissel's body it's made up of actually Nissel bodies are actually a aggregation of granules of rough endoplasmic reticulum so here you can see the dark bluish color that is basically the aggregation of Nissel granules that is absent here you can see that at this point a you can see the feel the absence of nissel granules that is present over the rest of the cell body so nissel body is made up of nissel body contains rough endoplasmic reticulum where it is found it is found in cell bodies of the neurons it is found in the cell bodies of the neuron but it is not present in the part that is immediately before the start of exon or exon hillux so nissel granules is the highest concentration is uh, in this book the key was given cell body of exon so exon is here there is no cell body of exon so I think what they meant to say was the cell body of neuron uh, some questions regarding meninges and dural sinuses pain from the middle cranial fossa is given by so the pain from middle cranial fossa it's mostly through the trigeminal nerve all of the three trigeminal uh, divisions they are contributing and supplying the sensory innervation of this middle cranial fossa here you can see that branches of uh, this v2 that is maxillary this is v3 mandibular and here the tentorial branch of tentorium cerebelli it is coming from ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve and the anterior cranial fossa for the reference it's basically giving getting branches from ophthalmic division of trigeminal and the posterior cranial fossa it's basically getting direct branches uh, from the cervical nerves c2 c3 and the fibers of the vagus nerve and hypoglossal nerve uh, running in them a scenario of subarachnoid hemorrhage in the scenario of subarachnoid hemorrhage you should know the intense headache and blood stained csf you will be having this discussion with your pathology teacher inshallah so i will not go into the detail for but for the anatomical purpose you should know that the subarachnoid hemorrhage is present within the cavity of the subarachnoid space and it is due to the rupture of the arteries that were present actually on the surface of the brain arachnoid granulations arachnoid granulations can drain into the number of superficial sinuses but the most common one is this superior sagittal sinus actually to be more accurate uh, there are lateral extension known as lateral lakes these lakes basically receive the arachnoid granulation so these are part of superior sagittal sinus so here is the answer cavernous sinus infection uh, actually through which vein they meant to ask first through which vein cavernous sinus infection traveled from the surface of the face so it is basically the superior ophthalmic vein you will always give preference to superior ophthalmic vein over the inferior ophthalmic vein 
because this angular vein is connected to the cavernous sinus directly through the superior ophthalmic vein but inferior ophthalmic vein either drains through the superior ophthalmic vein or through the pterygoid plexus there is no direct connection some questions regarding ventricular system regarding csf of a healthy person which statement is true for this purpose you should memorize this amount of information that is given in your kaplan neuroanatomy for the purpose of neuroanatomy i will recommend kaplan neuroanatomy for the part 1 examination so the glucose is less than the plasma and to be more accurate the glucose is about the two third of that of plasma csf glucose is low protein is high cells lymphocytes is more so at least there is something alive in there that is using up glucose antibodies proteins are producing against it and lymphocytes are there so lymphocytes are mostly generating against tuberculosis so ye uh, hai tuberculosis uh, tb will be the correct answer csf is secreted from and that's a simple question it is secreted from the choroid plexus here in the red color it is shown choroid plexus these are present in all of the ventricles both the lateral in the roof of the third ventricle in the roof of the fourth ventricle cerebral aqueduct of sylvius cerebral aqueduct of sylvius it connects the third ventricle from the fourth ventricle so this is the cerebral aqueduct of sylvius and another question that comes regarding that is that it is the one that has the most frequent occurrence of congenital stenosis and it is the most frequent cause of congenital hydrocephalus the roof of anterior horn of the lateral ventricle is formed by uh, it's very less likely that when ventricular relations are asked but again the anterior ventricle relations are have been asked sometimes so it's always a good idea to give them a read so here the anteriorly here the anterior horn of lateral ventricle so anteriorly it will be covered by the body of the corpus callosum and for future reference the anterior horn is laterally related to the caudate nucleus and medially related to the septum pellucidum let's move on to the spinal cord in the spinal cord we will uh, first discuss the motor system then we will go on to the sensory system inshallah extra pyramidal damage effect is i have compiled a list of the features from the snell neuroanatomy so what are the features for pyramidal tract which are the features for the extra pyramidal tract so uh, go ahead pause the video and go through them but actually what happens is most of them uh, does not occur independently most of the lesion it include both the extra pyramidal and pyramidal symptoms so here what has been asked extra pyramidal reflex it leads to hyperreflexia increased deep tendon reflexes dysarthria is through the cerebellum pin rolling tremors is from the parkinsonism basal ganglia hyperreflexia again not a part of it same question oh, extra pyramidal tract will show the answers are given different so here the answer is um, clasp knife rigidity so what is that uh, the inhibitory action on the golgi tendon uh, organs it is reduced and due to that whenever uh, overall there is a baseline increase in hypertone and but in a hypertoned joint when you try to flex a wrist joint or any other joint the golgi tendon organ now they are not inhibited by upper motor neurons that were traveling actually in the extra pyramidal tract without the inhibitory action of those the golgi tendon organ with react excessively and while at one time when they were resisting the motion due to their hypertone suddenly their tone will be gone due to the ex overactive response of the golgi tendon organs so this is the clasp like rigidity pubinski sign present in mostly uh, due to the pyramidal tract Cremasteric reflex again dependent upon the pyramidal tract. Led by rigidity, it is dependent upon the basal ganglia. Upper motor neuron feature. Actually, both of them. Uh, this one is correct. B1. Exaggerated reflexes. Babinski stain is basically present in upper motor neuron lesion. Hyperreflexia. Hyperreflexia is there. Painter point to point discrete movement is by. This point to point discrete movement. This is basically by the. This answer was given to Bruce Manner in the uh, escapal actual it's key, but I would humbly like to give my opinion. I would like to go for cortical spinal tract, and for this reference, I have given the reference from the review, 
no snail clinical neuro anatomy so here you can see the rapid scaled movement it is done from the rapid scale movement it is done by the corticospinal tract and uh, if we are on the topic if we are talking about the descending tract I would like to you to learn a mnemonic VIP makes it stand we sit on a rubber mat so is mnemonic ka kya fayda hai so VIP vestibular spinal tract P pontine part of reticular spinal tract these both they are be more dominant extensor tracts they make you stand they make your extensors active you sit on a rubber mat r for rubrospinal m for uh, r for rubrospinal and m for medullary part of uh, reticular spinal both of them are dominantly activating flexors of the body they make you sit you sit on a rubber mat so here are the topic about that point to point discrete movement same question corticus final answer actually uh, in a question behind the book gave answer rubrospinal i'm talking about escapal but immediately in the next question the correct answer was given cervical extension injury will result in whenever there is uh, in the neck region there will be lower motor neuron type lesion of the upper limb so what happen the brachial plexus it originates from c5 to t1 so if those are damaged there will be lower motor neuron type lesion of the upper limb but there will also be upper motor neuron type lesion of the lower limb so here is the injury somewhere here so lower motor neurons of the muscles of the upper limb so these will be damaged and person will have lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron type lesion of the lower limb this answer is not given otherwise that would have been correct also correct pairing of reflexes i keep on telling you for the deep tendon reflexes you should know the root values so here it is the bicep reflex on the c6 a weight lifter was lifting weight in competition suddenly the arms gave up and he dropped the weight what is responsible for that this particular done was golgi tendon organs what happens was inverse muscle stretch reflex was activated there was a high tension developed in the muscle and in the tendon the high tension led to the activation of the golgi tendon and this golgi tendon through the inhibitory interneuron it led to the relaxation of the muscle so golgi tendon organ it activates inverse muscle stretch reflex in cases of high tension this is exactly what we discussed back in the clasp knife rigidity that was basically an exaggerated form of inverse muscle stretch reflex due to the lack of inhibitory inhibitory signals from the upper motor neurons weight can be added weight was added limb suddenly drop exact same question inverse muscle stretch reflex in this they did not ask about the golgi tendon they asked about the reflex name a young girl has three books in her hand when the fourth one is added she drops all her books reflex was same question same answer flexion reflex is due to flexion reflex is one when you touch something and you do not like that feeling and you immediately pull the limb backwards simply known as withdrawal reflex so that is due to the noxious stimuli some type of stimulus that you don't like that can be a hot object that can be a, a sharp object or that can be even any Thing, anything that is not of your liking. For example, you put down your hand in the jar. You see something slimy in the jar. You just immediately pull your hand back. So any type of nauseous stimulus can does that. H is carried by. So this is the question. I did not agree to the original answer that was given in the escapal. The original answer given to the escapal was dorsal column C fibers. I actually spent a lot of time today finding the answer. the interesting thing was uh, the big books in the neuroanatomy of snell even the grays neuroanatomy they do not mention the h what i found was i found the h sensation in the guyton and hall in the guyton and hall h sensation are mentioned in the entolateral system now in the entolateral system both the anterior spinothalamic entolateral system consists of both the anterior and posterior anterior and ventral 
uh, let me rephrase the antelatal system consists of the both ventral and lateral spinal cell matrix so these both options are given actually to the best of my ability both should be correct if guidance say antelatal system you should acknowledge it but let's dissect it further so uh, i found a few articles uh, this was a very highly cited article it again it totally focused on the anterolateral you know, ventral lateral chordotomy it was talking about the chordotomy when ventral lateral chordotomy was done its sensation was gone but uh, i found one reference for the itch is that in the genong's review of medical physiology it was written that itch and tickle are related to pain sensations so we can use it to our advantage so because the pain sensation and the temperature sensation there is particularly are more dominantly carried in lateral spinal thalamic tract so this is a weak uh, link uh, that we can go give and take lateral spinal thalamic tract our correct answer but this last part denote, denoting it only to lateral spinal thalamic tract this is a speculation that i made on basis of this particular information so if you have any better reference any solid reference please do give me i will incorporate in them in my later talks so that it would be beneficial for all of us pain and temperature pathway pain and temperature pathway is more dominantly in the lateral spinal thalamic tract this is in a picture from the neuro anatomy snell's neuro anatomy the cell bodies of the fasciculus gracilis they lie in they lie in the posterior gray column and actually that is not a very good uh, actually this is not correct answer uh, for some reason and uh, it was marked this way this is not correct answer actually the correct answer should be this one ganglion you see the cell bodies of the fasciculus gracilis fasciculus gracilis is the one that is moving all the way here you can see that the cell fibers enter the body and they move all the way to the medulla so this is fasciculus gracilis so here even in this picture you can trace where the cell bodies are this fasciculus gracilis if you trace it back the cell bodies are present here outside in the dorsal ganglion of the spinal nerve so in my opinion in my humble opinion the answer would be dorsal root ganglion the sense of proprioception is carried by it is carried by dorsal column medial lumbar system for the purpose of this exam you should be very very much well versed about these three tracks dorsal column medial lumbar system spinal thalamic tract and cortex spinal tract and for the sensory system you should be very much uh, it must be on your fingertips which particular sensation are carried by which track at least for these three tracks anterolateral that is also known as spinal thalamic and then there is dorsal column medial lumbar system then the third one is cortex spinal tract the lesion of the dorsal column will cause again if you know the functions you will find out that it will cause a stereognosis because stereognosis it is the function of the dorsal column stereognosis mean ability to identify objects by touch if you put your hands in the pocket you recognize that there are keys in your pocket that is stereognosis dorsal column damage will result in sensory ataxia um actually it's another talk this track is basically a very much in connection with the premotor area and again the sensory area and the highly skilled movements these are being uh, done by that and ataxia actually i'm sorry for that ataxia is um, let me um rephrase one minute so it is basically in coordination and um, it can be due to the cerebellum features but uh, i just as i told you uh, this is indirect communication uh, with the highly skilled areas that are premotor area so it does lead to the sensory ataxia the patient standing normally with eyes open but falls to the side when eyes is closed the lesion is in the normal proprioception it helps in you in standing upright when you are even not looking if that is not working you cannot look you cannot stand upright without looking and without the visual clues 
so here the dorsal column if there is damage it will lead to the loss of proprioception and it will lead to the failure of standing up with the eyes closed sensory spiral ganglia have which neurons sensory spinal ganglia that is also known as dorsal root ganglia it does contain pseudo unipolar type neuron uh, there is a single short process that is further divided into two one one is the central one that goes into the spinal cord other one is the peripheral one that is going all the way to the sensory receptor from which it is bringing the signal rexy lamina 3 and 4 uh, for this if you read kaplan your anatomy you will be golden so here you can see that they have given the answer here in this box uh, these lamina which one um, are given in this so these one are the posterior greyhound before defecation maturation the sense of completeness is carried by uh, again this was one of the questions that troubled me a lot uh, again this was not present in one of or either of the major books not even Genong, Guyton and uh, even Big Grays and Neurosnell so the answer was given dorsal column medial amniscus system uh, but I had an objection to that so I found out there was an article uh, this article particular article it gave credit to all of the tracks for the mixturation spinothalamic spinohypothalamic tract but here was a good clue the afferent component of these nerve consists of myelinated a delta and unmyelinated c exon now if you have read kaplan neuron anatomy you will find out that these both of these a delta and c these are part of anterolateral tract so this was a strong uh, indication towards the anterolateral column and uh, one a more I found from the Carpenter's Neuroanatomy. This is a very standard book of Neuroanatomy, and uh, this says that sensory information about status of the bladder reaches the conscious level through the long and poorly defined multisynaptic pathways. It is suggested that these pathways lie in the dorsal half of the lateral funiculus. Now they have not given the actual name of the pathway, but the presence in the lateral funiculus in the lateral white column it rules out the answer that is dorsal column medial amniscus system so combining the two information the i think in my humble opinion the correct answer should have been the lateral spinothalamic tract the pain temperature is gone on the left side the medial column right spastic paralysis right so pain and temperature is gone on the left side spastic paralysis on the right side so in brown sequence syndrome if you know that there is ipsilateral loss of uh, there is ipsilateral spastic palsy and there is contralateral loss of pain and temperature medial core the correct sentence should have been medial dorsal column medial meniscus system features are on the right so these you should know in the brown sequence syndrome these three tracks the corticospinal track effects that is upper motor neuron lesion that is spastic paralysis that is on the ipsilateral side the dorsal cord of medial meniscus features that are two point discrimination proprioception and all that those are below the level of lesion on the ipsilateral side and the pain and temperature that are the features of anterolateral column these are present below the lesion on the contralateral side so it is the brown sequard syndrome an engineer in a boy when riding a bicycle doctor suspect hemisection at the mid thoracic level uh, which lesion should be present um, below the lesion there will be spastic paralysis and spastic paralysis will be on the same side spastic paralysis ipsilateral difficulty in walking brisk ankle and knee reflex absent bicep reflex so there is an upper motor neuron type palsy for the lower limb and the lower motor neuron type palsy for the upper limb this means that whatever happened it happened in the cervical regions bicep reflex is absent now it gives you a clue that the injury is at c5 and c6 level a main gap accident and complete transaction at t1 level what will have permanent loss of tendon reflexes below the level of lesion and no it will not be occur because the tendon reflexes are independent upon the higher motor functions and they will be hyper reflexes after the person has emerged from the injury temporary loss of stretch reflex below the region yes it may be correct because when immediately there is a spinal shock immediately it's like whole of the spinal cord is in the type of lower motor neuron palsy but as the time passes the person comes out of the spinal shock then the reflexes are exaggerated 
and then upper motor neuron type features they exhibit themselves the upper motor neuron type features they do not exhibit immediately they are exhibited later on as the person comes out of the spinal shock so this is the correct answer permanent loss of conscious above the lesion no there is no loss above the lesion loss of voluntary connection above the lesion again above the lesion temporary loss of conscious proprioception below the lesion again this is not if there is a loss it will be permanent spinal nerve emerges from I don't it's very simple question but it has been asked multiple times it emerges from intervertebral foramen the foramen that is present on either side of uh, vertebral column uh, between two adjacent vertebra so it has been asked like this true about spinal nerves leave from intervertebral foramen and like this regarding spinal nerve it leaves from intervertebral foramen so these were the questions regarding the spinal cord let's move on to the brain stem mid brain to cerebellum connections uh, it is superior cerebellar peduncle this one that connects the mid brain to the cerebellum again this is very much frequently asked which connects mid brain which connects the pons and which connects the medulla oblongata to cerebellum superior colliculus is located in superior colliculus is on the posterior aspect of the mid brain so these are the superior colliculus they are related to the vision they are con reflex control of the eyeball movements also Nucleus gracilis, nucleus cuneatus, the lesion causes. If you read the dorsal column medial meniscus system, you will see that these are the second order neuron of that system. So, if you know the features and the effects that are causes, caused by those lesion of those, you will find out that estereognosis that we discussed before. So, these are the nuclei that are being damaged fascicular nucleus cuneus nucleus gracilis and cuneatus here the cuneatus on the lateral side gracilis on the medial side so if they are lost this function astereognosis uh, will occur pathway that controls conjugate head and neck movement it's a very beautiful topic if you go in detail but for the purpose i'll just uh, name it the medial longitudinal fasciculus um, if you read it when you read it i think you, uh, it's a very interesting topic you should know that it connects the oculomotor nucleus to the opposite side of opposite sided abducens nucleus and then there is whole pprf and frontal eye field inshallah we will go into the detail if you get a chance the loop of basal ganglia controlling extraocular muscle a majority of the extraocular muscles are being controlled by oculomotor nerve so that will be a correct answer all both of the other options they don't have nothing to do with the movement of eyeball optic it's totally sensory and facial loop i have added the picture of facial loop here facial loop it is actually a loop but it has nothing to do with the movement of extraocular muscles nausea vomiting with vertigo vertigo uh, it is related to the vestibular nuclei and vestibular nuclei in the medulla oblongata it is very much this here is the vestibular nuclei here it is very much closely related to the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve so here the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve it can elicit the vomiting response so vertigo it can be closely related to vertigo due to their anatomically close location the dorsal vagus nucleus located in i know there are a lot of nuclei in the brain stem um, ideally you should be knowing them at least the amount of information that is present in Kaplan neuron anatomy I think that should be enough but the interesting thing is that uh, at least in the golden nine medicine and right a lot of questions have been asked regarding the nucleus of the vagus nerve so I have given the detail here you can pause the video and take information from here the dorsal vagus nucleus it's located in it is located in upper part of medulla oblongata it is present in upper part of medulla oblongata located in medulla oblongata you can see that in the changing dates below it has been asked multiple times vagus nerve fibers take general visceral efferent fibers from i will not go into the detail regarding the seven types of nerve fibers but general visceral efferent fibers are one that are actually parasympathetic fibers parasympathetic fiber are going away from the dorsal vagus nucleus the rest of the information i have added in the text form go ahead read them it has been asked at least in these questions general visceral efferent fibers from the dorsal vagus nucleus general visceral efferent fibers from the dorsal vagus nucleus tractus solitarius 
Tractor solitarius is the one basically the sensory innervation from the viscera's of the body that are being supplied with the vagus nerve. For example, stomach. The sensory information that is going through the stomach with the vagus nerve, it ultimately will terminate into the tractor solitarius. And tractor solitarius will be the second order neuron. The original nucleus will be in somewhere in the um, plexuses in the GIT or and from then here the cell body will be there and those that axon will move all the way up and the second order neuron will be the tractus solitarius nucleus ambiguous nucleus ambiguous is related to the glossopharyngeal vagus and cranial part of accessory nerve glossopharyngeal supplies the stylopharyngeus muscle vagus supplies the muscles of the palate except one tensor villi palatini muscles of the tongue i'm sorry the muscles of the palate except one tensor villi palatini muscles of the pharynx except one stylopharyngeus that was being supplied by the glossopharyngeal and the muscles of the larynx all of them and uh, the accessory nerve cranial component it basically it merges with the vagus nerve and it supplies all of these structures and even in the newer books uh, it is being said that cranial part of accessory nerve it's not a separate entity it's actually a component of vagus nerve but that and other detail will stick to the traditions the loss of light reflex accommodation intact if there is a loss of light reflex but accommodation is intact the lesion would be in the pretectal nucleus because when a person it he receives a light it goes from the retina through the optic nerve optic chiasm optic tract here before the geniculate body the fibers they leave and they here reach the pretectal nucleus from there they go on to the dinger westphal nucleus on both side and from then they go all the way to the ciliary ganglion and the pupils but the accommodation accommodation happens the light it reaches the retina optic tract chiasm radiation geniculate bodies radiations all the way uh, to the optic visual cortex from the visual cortex here the frontal eye field the connection is to the frontal eye field and frontal eye field directly communicates to the dinger westphal nucleus so the accommodation reflex it bypasses the pretectal nucleus so if pretectal nucleus is damaged then nothing will be happened to the accommodation reflex because it does not pass through the pretectal nucleus it is known as prost uh, prostitutes people also uh, go ahead and also read the marcus gun people and uh, ed's pupil also if the basilary artery is blocked it will cause uh, when the basilary artery is blocked basilary artery is present in the midline in the front of the pons sometimes arteries are present sometimes on the other side here the arteries are affected on one side but sometimes when complete artery is blocked this whole anterior component it is damaged and um, it is um, hypoxic so when it happens and these descending fibers corticospinal tract it uh, stops functioning and when it stops functioning it will lead to the quadriplegia if there is uh, it's actually it will depend upon the question if the question is that there is a large uh, injury and the large injury then there will be lead to quadriplegia because both sided corticospinal tracts are damaged but in case of small injury or if they, it is limited only to the one side then there will be contralateral upper motor neuron dipalsy but there is no option of contralateral um, upper motor yes spastic palsy so our option in this particular will be the quadriplegia cat is decerebrated at mid collicular level what will happen actually it's an interesting topic but a little big topic i hope so i can um, help you in understanding the cat is decerebrated at mid collicular level here you can see that the injury the mid collicular level section is indicated by level a what happens is that the the tracks which are damaged here due to this cut the corticospinal track is it, it is intersected due to this cut the rubrospinal track it is intersected by this cut what i told you you sit on a rubber mat and though flexor dominant tracks this rubrospinal corticospinal tract these are not not functioning the flexor muscles will not be functioning adequately but these functions the reticulospinal tracts especially the reticulospinal tracts 
and these are functioning nice because the nucleus of the reticular formation it is below the midbrain level and even their activation it's not possible from the higher brain center uh, higher brain centers due to this lesion this they will be activated due to the upcoming ascending sensory tracts that are giving their collaterals to the reticular formation so now the vestibular spinal uh, sorry the vent reticular spinal tracts the reticular spinal tracts will be activated but rupra spinal tracts will not be activated so a person will have dominant extension due to that whenever there is a midcolocular level incision occurred uh, there is decerebrate posture where both the upper and lower limbs are in the extended position now what happens is that they do not directly activate the alpha motor neuron uh, i'm not going to do the detail of alpha and gamma motor neuron they activate the gamma motor neuron gamma motor neuron are the one that actually they increase the sensitivity of the muscle spindles of the extensor muscle when the muscle spindle sensitivity is increased due to that reflexively the tone is also increased when the spindle is hyperactive uh, it uh, from the reflex as this small reflex are it activates the alpha motor neurons locally and it leads to the increase in tone so the muscle spindle it activates the increases the tone with the help of myotactic or stretch reflex so here is the answer there is exaggerated stretch reflex so this is a picture from genom and while i was taking the picture from the genom except this question was taken line by line even the including the cat answer from that particular book uh, you can go and read for yourself also weber syndrome weber syndrome is the one it is shown here uh, when there is weber syndrome and there is a loss of corticus spinal tract in, and the uh, lesion of the uh, oculomotor nerve when the oculomotor nerve is damaged then uh, there will be ipsilateral ptosis and lateral division medial rectus will be paralyzed and abducens nucleus uh, with the help of abducens lateral rectus muscle it will go to the lateral division of the eye dysphagia dysarthria um, dysphagia dysarthria so there is a problem with the muscles of pharynx there is a problem with muscles of larynx so both of these were supplied by nucleus ambiguus and in uh, ipsilateral horner syndrome ipsilateral face sensations loss so these were present in the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal these were present in the spinothalamic tract both were present on the lateral aspect so we are talking about a nucleus that is present in the uh, of the vagus that is in the medulla oblongata and due to this we know that it is present on the lateral aspect so the loss of that is with lateral medullary syndrome here in the shown b and the artery that is supplying the lateral medulla this is the this one that is known as posterior inferior cerebellar artery so here you can see that the lesion it leads to the loss of vagus nerve that leads to the dysarthria and dysphagia and here are the corticospinal tracts here you can see that spinal trigeminal tract and nucleus that lead to the ipsilateral loss of face sensation and spinal heart descending hypothalamic tract these are the descending hypothalamic tract this these are descending hypothalamic tract leads to the horner syndrome ascending reticular formation um this is you uh, this is in the floor of the aqueduct of sylvius it is actually there is three uh, longitudinally arranged nuclei uh, series of nuclei the midline ones are the raf nuclei and these are present on the anterior or roof of the aqueduct of sylvius raf nucleus they produce serotonin uh, this was given in the brs these are uh, it's a series of nuclei that produces serotonin but uh, raf nucleus was one of them autonomic nervous system transmitters and autonomic ganglion here you can see that it's in that autonomic ganglion it is the acetylcholine control of autonomic nervous system that sending fiber they do come from the hypothalamus um, again there are two nuclei uh, you go into the detail when you do the hypothalamus we will discuss it then posterior post ganglionic sympathetic fibers are in in the thoracic nerve cervical nerve sacral nerve lumbar nerves all spinal nerves yes all of the spinal nerves they do contain the post ganglionic sympathetic fibers thoracolumbar outflow thoracolumbar outflow it's from the sympathetic system it is from t1 to l2 this thoracolumbar outflow is from the sympathetic system the parasympathetic outflow is the craniosacral it is from the cranial nerves 
टू सेवन नाइन टेन एंड द सेकेंड नर्व टू थ्री फोर विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग हैज पैरा सिंपथेटिक कॉम्पोनेंट ग्रेटर लेसर लीज फ्लैंकनिंग आर द वन दैट आर एग्जिटिंग द थोरेसिक पार्ट ऑफ द सिंपथेटिक चेन बाई नाउ यू शुड नो द एग्जैक्ट रूट वैल्यूज टी फाइव टू टी नाइन ग्रेटर टी टेन टी इलेवन लेसर एंड टी ट्वेल्व लीस्ट एंड दीज आर ऑल प्री गेंगलियोनिक सिंपथेटिक नो ओनली पैरा सिंपथेटिक इज पेलिक स्मैकनिंग नर्व दैट आर हेयर दैट आर अगेन प्री गेंगलियोनिक एंड दे आर एस टू थ्री एंड फोर द नंबर सिक्स सिंपथेक्टमी विच गेंगलियोन स्पेड एल वन गेंगलियोन स्पेड एंड आई एम गिविंग द रेफरेंस ऑफ लास्ट एंड एट मी सेरिबेलम द फाइन मूवमेंट्स आर कंट्रोल्ड बाय सेरिबेलम यस द कॉर्टिकल स्मेल ट्रैक इट गिव्स द ऑर्डर ऑफ इट एंड इट कैरीज द सिग्नल बट दैट सिग्नल इज फाइन ट्यून्ड बाय सेरिबेलम फॉर द मूवमेंट्स इवन फॉर द सेरी विदाउट द सेरिबेलम देयर विल बी ट्रेमर्स पास पॉइंटिंग एंड ऑल द अदर कोर्स फीचर्स मेन फंक्शन ऑफ सेरिबेलम इट इज बेसिकली कोऑर्डिनेशन इन अ सिंगल वर्ड द फंक्शन ऑफ सेरिबेलम इज कोऑर्डिनेशन coordination of agonist and antagonist muscles intentional tremors it is from the cerebellum unintentional tremors it is from the parkinson and basal ganglia same question asked multiple times by the way resting tremors intentional tremors these are asked a lot of times to differentiate between the two and you see uh, in options both are given cerebellum is given so basal ganglia is also given past pointing wide gate rapid coordination um i am adding this list to all of the slides so by if you take a time pause your video and uh, take a look at all of them these are the different features of the cerebellar sim lesion and there is a lot of pool of question where it simply ask this particular feature is due to the lesion of any one of them will be asked here dysmetria again you see past pointing these are asked again and again this question already discussed cerebellum to midbrain it was the superior peduncle the cerebellum midbrain is connected to the superior peduncle same question now going to basal ganglia uh, a very interesting question that is very simple it is being asked frequently is that you should know the names of all the basal ganglia and after that they just asked which of the following is part of basal ganglia it's not a part of basal ganglia here it's a part of basal ganglia it's caudate actually here substantial nigra is also a part of basal ganglia but if actually all of them are part of basal ganglia in this particular question uh, don't fuss over it caudate nucleus is part of basal ganglia substantial nigra is part of basal ganglia put them in caudate nucleus and putum and these are part of basal ganglia don't fuss over it which of them is better answer all of them are just open kepler neuron at me see the first page and uh, see the list of all the mm, structures that are considered to be part of basal ganglia here caudate nucleus is given here yeah, i can argue with that that here the substantia nigra is also present if both of them are present you can give preference to caudate nucleus because it's present in the actually it is present in the telian cephalon in the white matter embedded in the white matter of telian cephalon substantia nigra is present below in the midbrain so either it is even it's functionally a part of basal ganglia but you can differentiate that it is not present there uh, with the rest of the structures of the basal ganglia so when both of them are present you can give preference to the caudate nucleus but uh, with putum in i just said that mcq needed to be revised needed to revision hyperkinetic disorders like chorea and acidosis are due to the lesion of and now uh, i will not uh, teach here exactly what is the direct pathway what is the indirect pathway but you should go ahead look into them and understand will the lesion of which will lead to the activation of which pathway direct pathway the lesion of direct pathway will lead to the hypokinetic disorders and the lesions of indirect pathway will lead to the hyperkinetic disorders but the simple thing is that on the simple question was given that basal ganglia is there and here you should uh, read this table and you should know that which particular disease is linked with which part of the basal ganglia like substantia nigra lesion is linked to the parkinson disease similarly there are all of the other. neostriatum is linked to the huntington's disease and so on and on 
so do that table and uh, the question has been asked in the previous question about the hemibilismus also huntington's also even wilson and all of them has been asked multiple times uh, it leads to the which of the clinical features are in the basal ganglia lack by rigidity class black rigidity babinski sign positive intentional tremor uh, this is in the cerebellum this is in the corticospinal tract this is in the extrapyramidal tract this is the correct answer lack by rigidity Nencephalon thalamus. Uh, here is a table given in the Kepler neuroanatomy regarding the function of each of the nuclei of the thalamus. Just go ahead and memorize it. They have been asked, uh, they will be asked. So, dorsal medial nucleus, it is related to the memory. Uh, nucleus related to the sensory supply of the limbs, sensory supply of the limbs, it is the ventropostulatal nucleus. Taste sensation it passes through it passes through the ventral posterior medial nucleus. Simply speaking, all of the sensations of the head and neck they pass through the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus. Here they have just asked the thalamus. And one more uh, nugget is that uh, the, all of the sensation they passes through the thalamus except one sensation and that is olfactory. Woman having increased appetite increases thirst. Complain of her anger behavior. Now there is a table regarding the nuclei of the hypothalamus and their functions. Do memorize them. A lot of them are frequently asked. Here the lateral hypothalamic center, um, hypothalamic center, it leads to the lateral hypothalamic center. It leads to the increased appetite and uh, along with that, <coughs> dorsal medial nucleus. It's closely related to this lateral hypothalamic nucleus. They both are activated at the same time. And the person becomes hangry, hungry and angry at the same time. Uh, the questions have been asked regarding uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus. These both separately, supraoptic, paraventricular regarding the secretion of ADH and um, oxytocin because uh, it is also part of endocrine system and in, asked in the endocrine physiology in the BRS. The questions has been asked about these two anterior region, posterior region. Anterior region is the stimulating parasympathetic. This region stimulates sympathetic nervous system. So these are the most commonly asked ones. Supporting cells in the past nervosa. Uh, this is past nervosa. Past uh, uh, nervosa is the posterior pituitary gland that is actually a part of diencephalon. Uh, it does not have any secretory cells. It has supporting cells known as pituitary sites. And uh, pituitary sites are drawn here. <laughs> I have uh, taken a picture from Deborah's uh, histology. The anteriorly there is uh, pars distalis so that is adenohypo. Ad there is an anteriorly there, there is adenohypophysis. Posteriorly there is um, neurohypophysis. Adenohypophysis is further divided into the pars distalis, pars intermedia. Uh, I will not go into the further detail of the um, adenohypophysis. It goes to in chromophiles and chromophobes, and chromophiles are further divided into eosinophils and basophils. Um, just no, don't go into the detail there. Just uh, the question that is frequently asked is about the pituitary side. They are present in the past nervosa. It supports the posterior pituitary, and it has not uh, secretions of its own. The past, the posterior pituitary does not have a secretion of its own. The actual secretions were from the hypothalamus. The cell bodies are present there. They produces ADH and oxytocin and they move through the exon and the dilated lower parts of the exons are present in the posterior pituitary. Past nervosa supporting cell pituitary side supporting cell past nervosa pituitary side posterior pituitary located in it's a part of diencephalon. Uh, woman having prolactinoma problem with the peripheral vision. When there is prolactinoma in the superior relation there is optic chiasm. Uh, here you can see the lesion number three. When pituitary gland it grows, prolactinoma is in the pituitary gland, and uh, when pituitary gland grows, it impinges the optic chiasm present on the top of it, and it present the central crossing fibers of it. When the central crossing fibers are affected, the medial or nasal uh, retinal fibers of the both eyes will be damaged, and it will lead to the temporal field of lazy vision from the both eyes. By temporal heteronymous hemianopia peripheral vision will be gone, tunnel vision will be activated. Neuroendocrine hormone, it is the oxytocin. It is basically, it is one of the two hormones, neuroendocrine hormones that are actually uh, produced here. 
in the hypothalamus and they are carried down by the axons into the posterior pituitary neurosecretory hormones stored in they are stored in nerve endings it, the same neuron that has cell bodies in the hypothalamus their own axons lower and nerve endings are present in the posterior pituitary and they stay there till the time of release the posterior pituitary hormones back secretory granules are in the nerve endings hypothalamic hypophysial system is related to of course that is related to the anterior pituitary that is adenohypophysis and from the hypothalamus secretion or releasing any pituitary hormones are coming and uh, in the anterior pituitary they lead to the release of those hormones uh, same question now we we'll come to the last thing that is cerebral cortex uh, interestingly enough the questions were relatively easy uh, easier than my expectations the right upper and lower limb weakness angle of the mouth deviated towards the left side if the angle of the mouth is deviated towards the left side it means the paralysis on the right side so it is uncrossed palsy uncrossed palsy whenever it is it is uh, above the level of pons it is supranuclear so whenever there is uncrossed palsy the lesion is above the pons it is in the cortex or capsular lesion so here only the question is asked what uh, option contains only internal capsule so that will be the correct answer pons should will be correct answer when the case is this the crossed palsy if the right sided left sided pons is there lesion is there there will be left sided facial palsy and right sided hemi spastic palsy of the upper and lower limbs right sided weakness upper and lower limb defects left sided mangle deviation exactly same question exactly same answer left leg left lower face paralysis so there is left leg and left lower face paralysis again same sided uncrossed palsy left homonymous hemianopia now i just said that uh, the lesion could be in the internal capsule and cerebral cortex but now in the internal capsule there would not have been the hemianopia left homonymous hemianopia it means something wrong with the visual cortex cerebral cortex so the answer would have been cerebral cortex but the correct here, here it is given forebrain so that would will take the next best thing it is a forebrain midbrain uh, no if there have, would have been injury in the midbrain first to future would could have been answered but we will not be able to um, justify the hemianopia in pons there will be crossed in medulla there will be no problem to the face center of emotions here the answer given in the scapel was cingulate gyrus um, but uh, i would like to point out that center of emotion is basically the limbic system so all of the component of the limbic system would be a correct answer here so that includes the cingulate gyrus also and hippocampal gyrus also ability to recognize faces it is lost in inferior temporal lesion and this is a very beautiful picture from the BRS neuroanatomy uh, I will be adding all uh, the pictures in the video so that you can go and go ahead and revise from this from the last time of the exam prosopagnosia exactly the same question it is inability to recognize faces it is in the inferior temporal lobe you can see superior middle and inferior uh, temporal gyra so uh, here the bitemporal loss leads to the prosopagnosia memory loss is related to again temporal lobe defected memory on the medial aspect so this is the picture of from the brs uh, i do not recommend uh, immediately for the pakistani fcps part 1 examination for uh, it's a very beautiful book it is a very book to be recommended but for this particular exam it's a little big you have to read uh, other subjects also in a short amount of time so go for kaplan your anatomy Uh, cerebral cortex internal capsule is damaged so if internal internal capsule is damaged there will be contralateral spastic hemiplegia so whenever there is in so here you can see that left sided internal capsule is damaged so all of the fibers they will cross the midline in the lower most part of medulla or 10% remaining will cross at the level of innervation so all of the internal fibers of the internal capsule they will ultimately supply the muscles on the opposite side so there will be contralateral spastic hemiplegia olfactory cortex it's in the temporal lobe so mostly you can see most of the fibers are going in here and um, olfactory cortex it 
consists of a number of things um, you not need to know it right now left temporal area is damaged it will lead to when only the left temporal area is damaged you only damage one half of the fibers that are moving from uh, of the optic radiation of one side so it is being carried the it is carrying the innervation from the lower half of the retina also it will lead to right upper right superior quadrinopia or prep to for the proper question right upper homonymous quadrinopia it is also known as pie in the sky uh, like uh, this you can see here it can be seen as pie in the sky it looks like a slice of a pie medial cerebral artery it supplies insula so this is the insula it is present on the lateral aspect actually deep in the lateral fissure but it is being supplied by the middle cerebral artery this question has been asked a number of times like this leg area in the cerebrum is supplied by here they have not uh, specified the motor area or sensory area but lucky for you for both of these the answer will be anterior cerebral artery even if it is the motor area or the sensory area the leg area is being supplied by the anterior cerebral artery Broca's area, Broca's area, it's located in the prefrontal um, area, so precentral area, so it is the uh, inferior frontal, it is the Broca's area, it is in the inferior frontal. Here you can see. Conducting aphasia, conducting aphasia is basically the loss of connection, communication between the vernix area and the Broca's area. So this is the connection between the two, the arcuate fasciculus that will be the correct answer here association between Broca's and vernix again the same question same answer arcuate fasciculus or a granular cortex uh, you should know that and the correct answer is motor cortex you don't not need to actually remember all of the layers for the purpose of your part 1 fcps exam uh, but the thing that you should know that, that there are two layers that contain pyramidal cells. Uh, you know the name pyramidal tract, pyramidal tract but descending motor tract. So all of the areas that have to deal with the motor um, tracts like the primary motor area, the secondary motor area, the motor tract, especially the primary motor areas, those will have well developed pyramidal layers. Broca's area will have well developed pyramidal layer, your primary precentral gyrus will have well developed pyramidal layers and the opposite is true for the sensory areas the sensory areas will have well developed granular layers granular layers are present between the pyramidal layers but they will have poorly developed pyramidal layers so a granular cortex the, where granular layers are not well developed that will be uh, that will be sen, uh, motor cortex that will be motor cortex where pyramidal tract will be more developed pyramidal layers will be more developed a 65 year old present with hemiplegia and facial palsy on examination lower part of face is more severely affected with the loss of voluntary movement of facial muscles if lower half of face is involved then the lesion would be above the level of pons so it will be supranuclear if the pons itself or facial nerve itself is damaged then it will lead to complete bell's palsy so this is it Thank you so much for watching, follow us on our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have any question, query or suggestions, even objection, feel free to contact um, via comments or the messages. We will be looking forward to your feedback and your response. Thank you so much. See you next time. Allah Hafiz.